Hi there. This is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot. So how's everyone doing out there tonight? We've, uh, we're having uh, Rebecca Jernigan, who is a very well-known talk show host, on with us at uh, on this show tonight. Um, Hello, Carrie. Hi. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, my dear. Nice. Happy New Year. And we're still here. Yeah, we are here. And... Uh, <laughs> And and this is the the greatest game in town, so why not? Yeah, you you got that right, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 might as well hang in here and with all the the visitors from all sorts of places off planet and whatnot. Uh, you know, it, it's plenty plenty activity here. No no reason to go elsewhere. Nope nope. We've got it all right here right now. Yeah, that's right. Planet so, of choice. Uh. What is going on with you since our Egypt trip? And one of the things I think people would be very excited to hear is just us kind of, you know, batting that whole thing around. Um, we haven't released, uh, I don't know if you've released any, any photos. I released like one or two, but we haven't really been able to do that. And I apologize to the people if anyone's listening who was on the trip. Uh, my webmaster moved on and to pursue his own career. Creative projects, and in the midst of all that, I haven't been able to organize getting a sort of a joint uh, photographic album up there. There might be another way to um, to to do it, you know, to do it. But uh, I haven't figured out how, and we're in the midst of hiring another webmaster, so that's going to be all good very shortly. But in the meantime. Do you want to talk about your experience in Egypt and how you, you know, some of the things that, that, that came across your plate, so to speak, and, and where it's at for you? Well, you know what? First of all, let me, uh, let me address the picture issue. Very funny about the picture issue. Um, I got back here, and um, I had, just, be, uh, just before I left for Egypt, my desktop computer literally shot craps. Um, and it, everything was locked up in it, you know, obviously, right? You know, when you lose your entire computer, everything that you've ever had is in there. So when I got back from Egypt, uh, my oldest son is a computer engineer. And he built me a new desktop computer for Christmas. That was my Christmas present. I was, I was absolutely floored. And so, you know, I got it back and I plugged it all in. It, it runs a different operating system. Uh, none of my software would work. I couldn't get my pictures downloaded into it because my camera, uh, it just wouldn't accept it. So I have not downloaded any um, or uploaded any pictures from the trip uh, yet. Uh, but I am going to see him over the weekend. He's got some uh, equipment that uh, he should be able to pull off my camera directly, my pictures, so I can bring them back. Uh, I can, I, I, I will begin that process, uh, Sunday or Monday, uh, putting up the pictures and, uh, getting some of those released. And I, I was looking through the camera, um, and I didn't take near as many pictures as some of the people did. And, and some of the pictures that I was looking back at, it was just fantastic, Carrie. First of all, I have to say, uh, it was very surreal. Uh, I, you know, I'm going to be really honest. It was very surreal. And up until the day we got ready to leave, I wasn't sure if we were going to leave. You know, all of that that hullabaloo over there about you know the you know the fighting and all of that, et cetera, and so forth. Well, you know, as we know, we witnessed it ourselves, Carrie. That that kind of stuff wasn't going on. And um, I want to kind of segue this in for a minute, and then I'll come back to it. Um, I was given a link today by a friend of mine. That uh, a person by the name of Cobra and somebody else was on uh, one of the George Nori shows recently, and apparently they were an, in Egypt at the same time you and I and, and our group was right, and there was just like this total correlation of the things that our guide was telling us that was going on behind the scenes, um, what we had to do to get into the temples and different places. Uh, this group also experienced, um, and it, it was it was pretty amazing to listen to, and I didn't get to listen to all of it, uh, but it was pretty amazing to listen to uh, this particular uh, show on George Norrie because it was talking about the very same things that we had already experienced, and it was so it's kind of fun to listen to it from another perspective. Um, 
I don't know who else was on, but the one person's name was Cobra, and I don't remember the other person's name. Uh, but it was, it, it, you know, if you're a George Norrie fan, you like listening to it, then I recommend people to go on and find that particular show. I don't have the link in front of me, or I could put it in there, and you could share it if you wanted. But it was, uh, it, it's, it gives another, a, another more in-depth picture as well of Egypt, besides what you and I and our group experienced while we were there. Um, but up until the time we got ready to go, um, you know, I was like, well, I, you know, I, I wasn't feeling well before we went and I knew I had to go and I didn't really know why I had to go. I just knew I had to be there. And I didn't know until we actually got into the Great Pyramid and, you know, well, well I'm not going to go to the end of the story first. Um, but while I was there, uh, going through all of these different temples, you and I were commenting on so many things. It was so funny. <laughs> I really did have a really good time with watching uh, the different levels of experience people were having, um, you know, going through these temples and, uh, you know, what they were picking up or what they weren't picking up. Uh, you and I both uh, had some very similar ideas on on a couple of things as, as you go through the pyramids and you look at the hieroglyphs and you, you begin to understand that um, perhaps the hieroglyphs are not being uh, interpreted correctly, right? And I think that's what I asked of our guide about, about the hieroglyphs. I said, where did they come from? I mean, who, you know, transcribed all of these? Where did that come from? And, and he shared with us that there were three languages. One was the hieroglyphs, the other was the cartouche, and the other one was the uh, hermetic. And that the schools in Egypt that teach Egyptology and teach hieroglyphics, uh, that it came from this gentleman's name, maybe you remember the gentleman's name, that originally uh, interpreted the hieroglyphs. And that's what the standard uh, has been set in order to interpret all of this writing all over these temples everywhere. You remember the guy's name? Yes, yes, absolutely. And and good memory on your part to remember all three types. Uh, yes, it's fascinating. And and. It's also fascinating that they then decide that they know what they mean. In other words, <laughs> it, it, it isn't an exact science. I'm sorry. You know, it's just not. And, uh, and, and when we, there were some interpretations that were so skewed, uh, towards, well, what, what a, basically you find out is that the same kind of people that, you know, were writing the Bible and rewriting the Bible and rewriting the story of history were involved in, in, in essence, translating hieroglyphs. So they bring their own filter in, and certain hieroglyphs, uh, like there was one hieroglyph they're pointing at, which didn't reflect what it, the guy said it was at all. And I'm looking at it, and I'm going, that's what they get from that? <laughs> you and I were standing there, and you said that to me, and I was like, yeah, see what I mean? <laughs> they're going, they, they're looking at this hieroglyph going, oh, well, that means worship your God. And I'm like, oh, right. Yeah. A yeah, bird, like, a half moon, and a piece of wheat. Yeah. <laughs> You're going, really? Really? Okay. That's not what I got from that, but okay. <laughs> but, but it's perfect, you know, because uh, if I'm an Anunnaki, I'm like, yeah, worship your God, dude. Do what I say. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And uh, do what you're told. Uh, That's right. Same, same difference. Worship your God. Do what you're told. So, uh, so you, you know, it's, it's where, where you actually drill down and start to realize who's translating this stuff to say nothing of the fact that they're, you know, well, let me not get into this whole thing about, you know, uh, white men, men of a certain race, uh, you know, intervening in history and writing history the, the way they want it. So, um, you know, it, it just, yeah, the whole thing on the temples, reinterpreting the temples, understanding who's writing history right now, who thinks they've got the, the 411 on what, what's really coming down and how they decipher it. And I'm sorry, but we're getting, we're still getting a terrible overlay, um, of, of a number of, of very distorted views of, of what's really being said on those, on the walls of the temples. Exactly. And you know, um, as we, when we first started out the trip and we, we were going to, uh, some of the, the temple ruins, um, what you do is you look at, they've been, 
uh, what they what they're showing to the public is is they go in and they excavate some of these sites. Uh, for example, I wish I could remember where we were at, um, uh, uh, but we were. Oh, you were sitting on. If you remember, you were sitting on that bench, and then all of a sudden the bench kind of. Uh, squished down, you go, so like there's nothing underneath here. It's like this is hollow underneath here. And in, it was in the ground, the excavation that was done. This wasn't one of those temples that was above the ground. It was below the ground. And you look down. Yeah, you look down and you can see these steps and there's this archway and all of that. And then you look over and you see these other steps and then all of a sudden there's a cement wall. They just stopped excavating or what they did was they excavated and then there was stuff there that they didn't want people to see, so they – this is what I got from it. Now, you know, obviously, I don't know that for sure, but I know that, <laughs> you know. And you look at it and you go, okay, so that's something else that they want to hide from us. And then we went into that one little building uh, where the um, – uh, where you guys all went down in, into that um, – way down deep at the very bottom. And then there was also the uh, graveyard there. That was then, in Alexandria in a, in a burial site. Uh, yes. And that, was, that was a Greek burial site. Yeah, and then we went into that little building right there, and it was the, just the small, yes. uh, two, two small rooms. And you're looking at all of the hieroglyphs on there, all the paintings actually uh, on there, and you're looking at them and you're going, wow, these stories, if, if what we've been told, um, and, and they're brought here on this, on this wall, um, they don't match up. None of these things seem to go together. They they appear to be very arbitrary. There was some of those things. There was a snake in there, and there was, I think that was the one that had the picture of Anubis or something in there, and something else. And you're looking yeah, at this. Yeah, they were going, merging. Uh, what they were doing, it was very interesting back in those days uh, when, uh, of course, the Greeks came into Egypt, and a lot of, uh, well, a fair number of the temples are still constructed by the Greeks. In other words, they were reconstructed. They had been, I don't know, destroyed or demolished and then reconstructed by the Greeks based on the Egyptian style of of doing architecture and replicating the prior building, but still putting in, you know, some, some twists and turns that were Greek. And in this particular area, they What they did was, and we were told by our guide, which is very fascinating, they were playing politics, even with the religion and with the hieroglyphs. So they were, in this particular case, they were combining some of the, uh, you know, the Egyptian, I guess, you know, animals like the alligator and and the Anubis. And they were they were morphing these these things together into uh, amalgamations. And, and and it was totally made up, like they were basically just trying to fit in. And and it was a complete distortion of the Egyptian original meanings behind these sim- the symbolism and so on. But this is what the Greeks were doing. Yeah. And and that, that, that place there was, was uh when I walked in there it was it the energetics on the walls themselves with the with the, the hieroglyphs and uh all of the drawings and everything on there was very chaotic because Nothing went with anything else. Energetically, it, it didn't, it didn't make a picture of anything. What you got was pieces, and that's exactly what that was when you, when, just as you said, you got pieces of information, but none of it was really connected. Um, very interesting. It was, it was really bizarre, um, in my opinion. And, you know, here was the funny thing. You guys went down into, into that, um, you know, down below, and then there, over there by the graveyard, there's this thing that says, uh, do not enter, and yet there's, there's nothing blocking anyone from going in there, and I was like, wow. <laughs> you know, the whole thing was just kind of very odd and bizarre when you think about it, you know, um, they didn't want anyone in, but yet they didn't do anything to prevent anybody from walking just down these steps into this, you know, into this other area that wasn't supposed to be open to the public. Yeah, but it, it, it the thing that's in Alexandria, and mm-hmm. the thing about Alexandria is that in many ways they're just starting to make that place accessible, and so they've got these places that have been trashed for centuries 
So there's all this garbage and all this destruction. And, and I think what they think is that, you know, there, there is the, you know, the initial place where you walk in, it, it is roped off and all of that has a fence and all that nonsense. But in the inside, they figure nobody's going to be interested. That's the thing. It, it seems like, and, and they, so they, if it's got garbage and it's trashy and all that, they figure, I mean, it, it does have a keep out sign, but other than that, you know, you walk down there. Um, it's sort of scary though. I mean, it is a graveyard and it is kind of, um, well, demonic. Yeah. Creepy is a good word. <laughs> creepy is a good word. Yeah, yeah. It was creepy. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was very creepy, very creepy. But, but, it, but Alexandria is a beautiful city. It oh, was God, it was great. There. Uh, in fact, we I talked to the guide, and our guide is just was so amazing and so open-minded. And, and basically, we were comparing notes and things about even coming back in the future and saying that we definitely need to spend more than one day in Alexandria. Mm. I think we could have spent three or four days just alone, um, yeah. you, know, just, you know, just kind of sitting with – uh, some of it because there's just so much what I found really fascinating myself Gary was the levels of stuff that is unseen the the massive massive quantity that is yet to be brought up to the surface or cleaned out and you know as you're sitting there when when you're sitting in all of this re- regardless of where we are at um, you look at this and you go if all of this was uncovered and we were able to see all of this what a shift in our perspective that this would make literally for much of the world if we knew exactly what all of this stuff that was not yet able, you know, that they've not excavated, yeah, the that truth they've not. About, the yep. truth about our history, absolutely. Yep. And, and <sighs> being in Egypt was, uh, was fascinating because as much as they are revealing, as much as the guide tells you the party line, you ultimately realized and, and, you know, luckily we were able to have all these kinds of dialogues with him, giving us him our perspectives on where things didn't didn't pan out, didn't make sense, didn't have a logical through line. And sometimes where they were completely uh, contradicting themselves and, and so on and so forth. And it, it's just fascinating that our history is so completely hidden from us, from humanity, our true history. And people think they know who we are as a species, and yet we don't know our history. And so the fact of the matter is we don't know, ultimately, other than, you know, I think self-realization can be an individual thing. So I won't say that individuals can't know who they are. But it, humanity as a whole, is, is their, their history is a mystery. And because of that, we can be lied to time and time again. Because we don't know who we are or where we came from. It's not open knowledge. And it's, it's, it's the biggest secrets. And so, I mean, obviously, this is why they can lie to people so much. Exactly. And then, they, and then when people, like all of the people that go to Egypt, to go and, and, you know, to experience it, it's so controlled about what it is that you can see about history what they want you to see about history, and they perpetuate the um, misinformation, just like we was talking about the hieroglyphs right from the very beginning, right, and, and all of that. Oh, I think we have a break coming up, don't we? Um, so we have a break coming up. We'll have to come right back with Rebecca Jernigan, and we'll be talking more about Egypt and uh, various other topics, too. Hey there, everyone. Uh, this is Carrie Cassidy talking to Rebecca Jernigan, and we're just uh, shooting the shit about <laughs> <laughs> just, just feeling like sort of mixing it up a little tonight. I'm kind Why of not? A weird mood. Um, let me see. Well, we're talking about Egypt and, and how they, they basically try to hide our history from us and that the this continues. It's, it's just like... Uh, it's like the biggest game out there, really, lying to the people about who they really are. And uh, it just boggles their mind, you know. And when you go to these places and you're actually in these power places and you're you're meditating and they're trying to, you know, you have to bribe the guards to keep them to uh, allow to let them allow you to do such a thing. Uh, you re- realize what a revolutionary act meditating is. 
And uh, when you have that in mind, I think, um, you know, I, I thought about it when I was there. I just thought, you know, they're all worried about these people uh, demonstrating in Tahrir Ta- Square. But what if they actually all went in there and started meditating? That would really scare the shit out of them. <laughs> <laughs> That ought to be the, the deal right there, you know, uh, change, change up the whole game for, for, for humanity. Let's go, let's, let's take a max, mass exodus and uh, a few weeks off and just head for all the power places on earth and meditate the hell out of it. And, uh, <laughs> and I think the game will be over. <laughs> well, you know, where were we at? Do you remember where we were at and we, we started to meditate and, oh my God, the people, the, 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 the military guys came in and they were like, no, no, you can't do that. I mean, we got shut down in one of those places where we were at. Um, it was uh, the only yeah. place we got shut down. Well, that that's because we had a guy that was more, he was prepared way way in advance uh, to, to set everything up for us and made it possible for us to do the meditations. But that didn't matter because if we did an impromptu meditation, uh, then they were on us like white on rice and, uh, and would just start heading for us, you know, guns drawn. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, really uh, the ultimate revolutionary act, as I said. So, you know, people really need to, to sit up and listen to that. Uh, there is a reason why those guards, I mean, the guards themselves don't know any better. They just figure, oh, they're, you know, the people they work for told them, you know, don't under any, you know, uh, <laughs> under any, uh, any any consideration let these people meditate in these places and and so they're just following orders but it's it's who the higher ups and the higher ups above them who are are sending the word down so then you have to look at the dark magicians who are at the top of the pyramid and obviously they know what we know which is you know that the power of 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 changing reality and of course, then I, I don't know if you had seen all the posts I made, but uh, I had a person on the ground after we left Egypt who had been had certain people monitoring uh, the Great Pyramid. And on the 21st at night, uh, government cars were escorting in certain foreigners, they were called, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, to meditate, to do their deal in, in the pyramid. Uh, almost said meditate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And whatever else they were doing. So you can see where where being in the pyramid at that time was very important. And obviously, they closed the pyramid down on the 21st. So they were going to make sure they had it to themselves to do their deal. Uh, luckily, we had been in uh, the day before and uh, done our, our stuff. And hopefully, that had a positive effect to counter some of the negativity that was was being put down there and and basically helping to change the game on earth and so we we did some very very powerful meditations in certain places do you want to talk about some of your visions uh, rebecca because i you know it was fascinating uh we both had visions while we were there and and you know you're welcome to to share some of your thoughts you know i i'd love to uh first let me let me speak to uh the last portion there that you were just talking on uh one of the things that that other interview that i was listening to uh was talking about was about the um uh the uh who shut the who shut the pyramids down and what we have to let people know is some some people may not know this is that uh while we were there and i think it started on the 1212 uh, they shut the pyramid down. They just they just shut it down. They didn't allow people to go in. It was just done. And then our guide came back after he found that out because we weren't due to be at the pyramid at that day, at that time. Um, but our guide was doing some research. I mean, he was on it. I just loved our guide. Oh my God, he was just one of the most fantastic people, really, uh, Carrie, that I've ever met. Just uh, uh, um, a most gracious being and knowledgeable and open-minded um i was very grateful that he was uh the person that uh we were with uh, during these experiences there truly i am um and then we found out that they were also issuing an order uh that it was closed to uh they were closing it what wasn't it the 19th the 20th the 21st or was it the 20 21 and 22 they're supposed to close it down for three days and our guide had already had already I guess he'd already foreseen that there could have been a problem 
uh, because he had already gotten some kind of a piece of paper <coughs> from whatever agency that he needed to get it from that would have let him go in there. And he went back and got another uh, verification on that so that we were able to go to the Great Pyramid when we were there. Yep. And hey, very hey. interesting. They, they were just, it's, it's a wonderful travel company. Uh, want to give them high marks and everyone on the group, in the group felt that way. Uh, they were just had our every, uh, well being in mind. And by the way, you know, there was very little, if any danger anywhere in Egypt. Uh, but we were heavily, you know, guarded and escorted and all that kind of thing. But the people of Egypt are just so gracious and so loving. I mean, grown men waving to the bus when it goes by. Uh, you, you know, you, you have to understand it's it's, it's just a whole different mentality. Um, the, the people on the streets are just gracious and loving. That's their that's their mode of being. It, it's a society that that just starts out that way. So where it goes from there, what kind of uh, pressures uh, turn individuals in, in certain other directions is another matter. But basically, the the culture is so gracious and and just uh, so delightful. I have to say, just just you remember seeing these grown men waving at the bus? Oh my gosh, yes, and and smile. Yeah. And then when we would show up someplace, they would come over and they would say. Uh, they would ask you, uh, where are you from? Are you from America? And then you would say yes. And then they would, the, you know, they didn't speak much English. But what they do is say, oh, we love America. And I was like, isn't that interesting? That isn't what we get from <laughs> We don't get that you guys love us. You see, so the whole thing is, it, it's like watching all of this. The people of Egypt, they don't have the issue. It's always these governments that have issues, the ones that want to create some kind of false um, premise and false pretense about what it's really like. Like when we got there, um, you know, we were not quite sure whether or not there would be any uh, violence going on because according to what we had been witnessing, there was a whole bunch of violence going on. But when we got there, we found out that hasn't the case at all. And for two years, that country, um, they because they have been touting this violence going on that really wasn't taking place, uh, in the manner in which they were presenting it, their tourism is down by 80%. This is their livelihood. This is how this country makes their living, is by people coming to visit these these ancient sites. And it was, it was kind of sad uh, to know that this kind of um, mechanism had been put into place that took these very loving, gracious people as, 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 as a culture and, and, and put them in that kind of a predicament to where they're even um, less capable of taking care of themselves because there isn't the influx of tourism. Um, I heard from a couple people just before we got ready to leave. I uh, met a couple people there from uh, from other groups that, that were staying at this, that same hotel. And they were talking about how they've always been there during that time. And you had to stand in line to wait to get into any of the sites. And we didn't have to do that. Because there wasn't the people. It wasn't just because we had the guide there, but it was because there wasn't the people. There just wasn't any tourism. Yeah. It was very I fascinating. Mean, the, guide, the guide said that, that tourism was down 80%. I mean, can you imagine? That's just huge. Uh, like I was telling people that we had an amazing run of the Egyptian Museum, which is a absolutely fascinating place. And normally uh, the, the people on the trip, such as Rebecca, have no idea the crowds that you deal with in that museum normally and where guides have to yell over each other in order to be heard by the by the groups they're guiding. And and we just had our free run. We could be very relaxed. Our guide, you know, could come and, and, and give his 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 talk and we could, you know, discuss things and browse around and it it was just, it was really fun. Uh, I have to say we lucked out in that regard. I have to say so, too. I was I was really, uh, and, and, you know, uh, uh, before I get into all the visionary stuff that took place, I want to talk about the Cairo Museum for a minute. Um, first of all, um, you know you're not in America when you're in Egypt. I mean, they, the things are just very different. Uh, you know, how they treat things, how they uh, react to things, um, how things are even displayed. Um, 
but it's very interesting. Our, our uh, the guide was very knowledgeable, talking about the uh, the different ages of uh, how they characterize or how they um, categorized uh, whether it was uh, old, middle, or new kingdom. What they called old, middle, or new kingdom. And I think that was the terms he used uh, in regards to the age of of the statues and the artifacts that were in the Cairo Museum. Uh, fascinating place, in as much as that. I got a sense that there was things missing from there. And, of course, you know I've never been there. And I got a sense that there was a lot of things that were missing, and some of the more important things um, were were never put there. They're, they just they're, – they've never been there. And that kind of goes with your people that you had on, I think – gosh, it's probably been a couple of years ago called Geomatrix or something uh, where they were filming uh, yes. uh, things going on coming out of the – uh, pyramids and are out of the temples and stuff in the middle of the night, uh, great halls of stuff. Um, and, and you can feel that when you go into the museum. You can just tell that what is there for public consumption isn't even the tip of the iceberg. And we have more s- stories to tell about that later uh, as we went through some other museums. But, you know, the, the visions that happened was 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 extraordinary for me. Uh, in as much as that, because I had never been there before, and I didn't want to know too much about it, because I really wanted to go in without having preconceived notions or uh, any influx of information. Uh, I just wanted to go in there as kind of a blank slate, see what showed up. You know, that really was what how I went to the trip with, um, to experience what I was going to experience on whatever level. You know, I didn't know if I was even going to have one, to tell you the truth, Carrie. You know, uh, that wasn't my point. The point was just to experience whatever showed up uh, for that for that purpose. That being said, we, we you know, uh, the first night, was it the first night or the second night that wave came in? Yeah, it, that was the 12th. And we'd barely been there uh, about a day and a half, uh, a little over. And we were departing that day uh, in the afternoon for Alexandria, but we had our morning free and we were... We were at the Mina House Hotel, I have to say, which is right near the – it's in it's in the, the, the sort of aura of the pyramids. It's right there at the foot of the pyramids, closest hotel to the pyramids. Uh, just a fabulous uh, historical hotel, very, very gracious uh, and grand hotel. And I have to say that I, I insisted – that this time my group stay at the Mina House. A lot of times when they take groups in Egypt, uh, the Mina House is fairly uh, steep price-wise, and they they tend to avoid it if they can because they can't, you know, because groups it, it raises the price. But I have to say that 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 was um, was was something I was really a stickler for, and now I'm very very glad I was uh, seeing the quality of the place and how it changes, just changes the, you know, having an atmosphere around you and, and being that close to the pyramids for a period of days is just awesome. So that set the scene. It, it really did. It really did. And, um, you know, uh, when you were in that particular place, uh, because, uh, the way our, all of our rooms, I think all of our rooms were set up, you know, got up in the morning and you opened up your drapes and there's the great pyramid standing here right in your face. I mean, it was, I was taking pictures and I was telling people back home, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm standing here in my hotel room and I can see, I'm, <laughs> see the great pyramid standing right here in front of me. And they're like, no way. I was like, way, seriously, it's right there. <laughs> And you don't realize what it's like. I mean, you can see all the pictures you want. You can do all of that, that what you want, but you're, you really can't experience it until you actually experience it. You go over there. But anyway, on this, this 12, 12, uh, 12, uh, a wave hit and, uh, it took some of the group down. Now I want to, I want to correlate that with this information that this guy was sharing on that show again, because he was talking about everybody in their group got sick the same thing happened to yeah. them Fascinating. Um, this is the fourth time i was in egypt i never had never got sick like that before it the wave came in uh this is is from you know the energetics that are are entering the planet and what i the strike places in my my view were some of the powerpoints on the planet so so giza was definitely one of the strike points 
uh, for this energy to to come in. And uh, boy, you could, it hit you like a wave. Uh, I got very very ill and just just knocked off my feet. Yeah, and then it and then it um, that continued. Unfortunately, it continued for many. Uh, for the the duration of the trip, we had a, we had another couple there that was. Uh, very difficult for them to even partake in some of uh, some of the activities because they were they were so unwell um, because of the energetics or or you know whatever it was that was going on. But I, I want to say, Carrie, that this guy was talking about. Uh, he's saying that there was also the the dark cabal is what I think is what he was talking about uh, that actually uh, was trying to get it so that nobody could go in. That's why they shut the pyramids down. Uh, that's why they shut down some of the sites uh, because they wanted their own people in there to do their work. Um, so he's saying that uh, he was also saying that they have pictures of some uh, supposedly some spaceships over the uh, pyramids, et cetera, and so forth that went on uh, the, the, and was was showing different vehicles. It was talking about different vehicles, these uh, long kind of uh, trains of vehicles coming in there and and you know these guys dressed kind of strangely all going into the pyramid uh, very interesting stuff and i was thinking wow you know that's why we were we were all feeling the way that we were but that being said uh after we got through that bit of the 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 12 12 thing we uh you know uh, you started feeling better and it, it, unfortunately it just kept coming back and forth is is what it did with the the sicknesses and illnesses for people um but um the the vision work was 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 pretty amazing as far as what showed up in my field. The the three visions, the three nights of visions happened. The closer, um, and I guess we we need to talk about the fact that the way that the trip was lined up is that uh, we went to uh, you know to Alexandria and around to some of the other temples as we made our way back up, uh, you know, to the northern part, you know, back over into. Uh, uh, towards the Great Pyramid, you know, that's kind of how we ended it. And it was like building this energy. I mean, you did a really uh, fantastic job with the layout of how we started the trip, where we went, and kept building the energy and building the energy. Um, as you stated, when we were in um, Alexandria, you know, there's a lot of Roman and Greek influence there. So the Egyptian, uh, the true Egyptian stuff wasn't quite as no- noticeable energetically nor visually either um, because of uh, the, the changes that took place, the physical changes that the Greeks and the Romans took place. But as we moved uh, through these different temples and through the landscape and moved up uh, back through, uh, th- we kept getting into what you would you know, maybe term as the more pure energy, uh, that which is really truly associated with uh, the Egyptian information, the Egyptian uh, energetics that hadn't been so uh, desecrated by the uh, Greeks and Romans. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I think the, the best way to, to maybe say this is that uh, when that wave of energy, I think you and I both kind of compared notes the next day about having uh, vision work the night before. Um and it was interesting. I didn't have any dreams while I was there in Egypt. What I had was four separate uh, visions that took place. The one was down there on 1212. And then the other ones came at, I think, around the 17th, 18th, and 19th, or the 18th, 19th, and 20th, something like that. No, it was the 17th, 18th, and 19th. They had three nights of visions, and it was all about the next places that we were going to go the next day, uh, which I found really fascinating um, because I didn't look at our itinerary. I just, you know, I was just, you know what, we're getting on the bus, we're going here, okay, so you can get on the bus and you go, right? Or you're on the ship, um, and, uh, the, in the water ship, I, you know, <laughs> the boat. <laughs> um, but I think where it started is after we left where we, uh, what's the name of that little place that we were at was the, Hotel in the island. Uh, okay, you're talking about, um, oh, God. Um, what was the name of that place? I can't even Aswan. think of it. It's, it's Aswan. Aswan, that's it. 
uh, I always want to call it on swan, and I know it's not right, so it's Aswan. Um, a, a lot of what was going to be occurring started for many people in Aswan. Um, that's where I began to see the tubes of light, uh, uh, the uh, pillars of light. Uh, I began to see them. I was taking pictures, and these these pillars of light would show up in my viewfinder. And um, yes, as we had a, a tremendous amount of of pictures being taken in from Aswan on of of light beings, even what appeared to be uh, a lot of light beings accompanying us on our journey, and of course orbs showing up in pictures. That's that's commonplace, but uh, in in this case, we actually had some some people like photographs being taken of people where a being would be, st- uh, you know, a light being would be standing so close to the person it would practically obscure the photo, so that you got sort of half the person and half a light being. Um, it was fascinating, you know, and and um, and people that don't normally have experiences like this were having those kinds of experiences. They found people were looking back at their cameras and finding uh, all of these different, uh, like you said, light beings or orbs or even these uh, pillars. Pillars of light were showing up for some people on their film itself, you know, on the camera itself after the picture was taken. Uh, Really fascinating uh, pieces. And I think that's when we we got down to Aswan is when I I really felt um, like the whole group – uh, those that were not um, uh, not native to the area, right? Any of the area in Egypt, I felt like those that they knew were light workers were being very protected. I really do. Yes, we, I think we had uh, some some great protection on the trip that was unseen. Uh, we'll be right back talking to Rebecca Jernigan. Okay, this is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio, and we're talking to Rebecca Jernigan uh, all about our Egypt trip. And Rebecca, I, we were sort of talking about a swan, and uh, then from there we were going to talk about, I guess, so, some of your visions that you were having. Uh, do you want to describe? You know, um, I remember having, a, like I said, a few of those, what I call the night experiences, the visions, uh, because they're not dreams, that's, that's for sure. Um, and, and the two that um, I can remember very clearly to repeat is um, I remember being uh, at a uh, site, at one of the sites. And, again, I need to remind people I've never been to Egypt physically. Uh, I did not know uh what any of the landscaping was or anything and as i'm uh, i'm recalling uh the vision i think to you and i think there's a couple other people li- uh, listening was that uh i was walking down these stone steps one side seemed to be a wall and the other side seemed to be open and the open side was open to the water and we get down to the bottom of the steps and there's this kind of like landing and uh again still made out of stone uh, you walk across it, and, and uh, sitting there was a flower, um, and this flower uh, was uh, um, in full bloom. And uh, as I was observing it, there was, and interestingly enough, is the people of our group, many of the, not everyone, but many of the people that were on the tour with us, were also here with me in this vision. So I thought that was also quite interesting. So as we're, as I'm looking at this flower. It closes, uh, the petals of it close up, and one drop of uh, liquid uh, comes from this uh, flower. And I was told uh, to grab that drop of water and to drink it. So I, I'm repeating all of this to you guys, and, and you're saying, well, that sounds like the place that we're going next, where they have the uh, flower of life. Um, a temple that we're going to. And sure enough, we show up and I'm like, well, yeah, this is pretty much just like my vision with the water. Um, and of course, you know, the, there's a story to that um, temple as we go along and, and maybe you want to come back and get to that because there were some things that I did notice while I was there. 
um, that seemed very out of place to me. And, um, uh, you know, it's the difference of the different, I guess, timelines, uh, civilizations that may have been there. The next one was when we were visiting the Sphinx. And the day before we visited the Sphinx, that night I had had a, a, a vision. And what had happened was is we, we showed up at the Sphinx's paw. And uh, there was a man there, an elder. Uh, I call him an elder because he wasn't an elderly man. He was an elder, like a, a wise man, what you would call a wise man. Very tall, uh, very, very pale skinned. Um, and... Again, leading our group, many people of the tour were um, were a part of this vision, and he does like this incantation, so to speak. Uh, literally, the paw of the Sphinx kind of uh, you call it opening up. It's like a portal almost that uh, that opens up, and he leads us down. Uh, we go in, and we immediately go down these stairs. We get down to the bottom of the stairs. We make this right hand turn, and we're in this hallway. And we're walking along, all of us, and we end up, there, there's corridors everywhere, by the way. Just tons and tons of corridors. But he's, you know, knows exactly where to take us. And then we end up in this, uh, middle room, in this room, uh, that there's an intersection. Uh, there's hallways on both sides. Uh, they go in both different, you know, in all four directions. Uh, in here is this, um, pedestal, and on this pedestal, is uh, something that belongs there, and he's asking for us to put this, whatever this thing is, back there. And I look down on the walls of this hallway, because you can see them, because it's open. There's no walls here. This is an open room, and you can kind of see these hallways going down. There's, like, plaques. And the interesting thing about these plaques, that's the only way I know how to word that, that's not an exact... um, interpretation but it's as close as I can get there's these plaques all up and down these walls of different uh, some of them have pictures and some of them have writing on them um, and they denote different races and these races um, have left a message um, and my understanding was, is when I was viewing that, was that um, it was like it was like um, like an informational book, so to speak. Each of them had a piece of information for those who would show up in this space, um, for our wisdom, for our knowledge, for understanding, uh, for knowing who's been here, where did we come from. Uh, in other words, a lot of pieces of truth, and there was just all these plaques up and down these walls, uh, up and down this hallway, from species and races I've never seen before. I've never witnessed in my physicality, in my vision work, or anything. Um, all very different from each other. Uh, some of them were like uh, symbols. Uh, some were just pictures. Some were pictures with uh, some type of uh, uh, vocabulary, a uh, written word. Um, and then we were... Uh, shown that there was a second sphinx. A second sphinx, sphinx is buried there. Um, and w- I was asking him about that. And as I was asking him about that, he turned around and got real nervous and made us all leave out of this space. And so we never did get to <coughs> see that other sphinx. But I do know that there is another sphinx there. And I do know that there's all kinds of underground tunnels. Of course, we know that anyway. Anybody that's energy sensitive can feel that when you're walking, literally physically walking uh, on the land. Uh, you can feel that there's all kinds of stuff that has, has yet to been uncovered. Uh, I think they, uh, I also believe that they know that there's a lot there and they're not willing. Even when they had the, um, uh, the go ahead to excavate, They didn't because they knew that the information was not for public consumption, that they did not want it for public consumption. Um, So that was that was a huge one there because that one was very long in duration. And I found it very kind of unsettling at the end um, because of the fact that it was uh, we were hurried back out of there. It was like uh, whoever this elder man that was leading us down there, um, it was like. He didn't want us to be discovered energetically, physically, whatever the case may be. Um, and then when we went to visit the Sphinx after that, there's a um, kind of a plaque, so to speak, 
that sits in the in the middle of uh, between the legs there um, of the sphinx, and it shows two sphinx uh, sitting there. Uh, so for me, there was a lot of um, um, acknowledgement, a lot of um, pieces of information that just kind of clicked in together that made total sense to me uh, with looking at all of these pieces, these individual pieces of, of this vision work and then actually being there. And then, of course, all of that was followed up by the uh, meditation that we did up in the King's Chamber, um, which really just solidified a, 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 a huge portion of these visions that I'd been getting for years and they were just pieces of it and I didn't actually know what it was well it was really all about this whole um, coming into this whole huge transition into this energetic space that we all came into uh, on this earth plane and when we were doing the vision uh, the the meditations uh, I, I just want to explain to people what what my experience was as I was in the uh, Great Pyramid first of all when anyone uh, was talking in the pyramid. Uh, I absolutely was perceiving uh, eight or nine separate uh, individual uh, tones of that same words that would come out of somebody's mouth. I heard it in eight, seven or eight different um, tones and frequencies uh, audially. Um, it, like when you were talking, Carrie... Mm -hmm. Uh, when you were, you know, doing the meditations, there'd be some things that you would say, and literally there would be these these uh, levels of listening to your voice as it changed tones uh, seven eight times as you were speaking, not after the fact, but as you were speaking. It is a huge, huge amplification chamber. Yeah. Uh, I would say that's true, but I would also say just for people that are, you know, listening to this, that one of the things that I was experiencing because I was leading some of these meditations was getting uh, sort of downloads as I was yeah. in meditation telling me or giving me the words to speak. And, uh, and it definitely felt uh, like there were more than just our group there. In other words, <laughs> they're behind the scenes sort of uh, assisting us along, orchestrating and, and assisting me with choosing the right words to, to sort of um, monumental, you know, make uh, sort of, I don't know, make the right resonance for the, the occasion, hit the right notes, so to speak, that kind of thing. And it was fascinating. It was absolutely fascinating, not only to witness that, but to experience that. And then in my own meditation, when I had my uh, a few moments there in which I was guided to, to say my portion of it, uh, the experience of feeling that come out of my mouth and watch all of those uh, resonant tones also show up. But, of course, I'm hearing it slightly different because it's coming from me as opposed to it uh, coming around me in the same manner uh, was it was extraordinary uh, when I was done um, I have to tell you is that there was like this this thumb that 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 came down and it was like a reset button um, and and really honestly that's what I felt like that that moment was that we were all up in there was that this was a reset moment um, there was a moment of uh, uh, and it was um, a very odd experience for me is to have this massive quantity of information, uh, all these different pieces of the puzzle, this uh, um, moving from me outwards, uh, an energetic um, feeling and making the connection of grid lines, of the natural matrix, of connecting things. I mean, that's what it felt like. It, this is was was an extraordinary experience. Uh, and in in a moment, and when when all was said and done, there was this like extreme stillness that came within me. An extreme stillness. I can't even begin to exp that doesn't even hold a candle to how I really felt, but it's as close as I can get. And um, I was then instructed to kind of sit there. Uh, you picked up some more meditation after that, um, and then it became very quiet. And you could he almost hear everyone's heartbeats. You could feel 
I mean, it was like all of a sudden everything became acutely uh, loud. Uh, you could hear uh, the slightest of noise became extremely amplified. The, the sensitivity of the hearing, of the sense, of the smell uh, just became extremely acute uh, in the moments following that. And even though it was quiet, it was literally like you could you could hear people's heartbeats and their their blood flow through their veins. It was an extraordinary experience, uh, very very heightened. I mean, seriously, I would have thought I'd dropped some kind of drug at that point because I was like, whoa, <laughs> wow! It was it was it was amazing. It, I mean, I was yeah. so amazed by it, I couldn't even talk about it. Yeah, I haven't. You know, this is really one of my first times of really talking about it verbally since since I've got back. Yeah, I can tell by, you know, the tone of your voice. I think a lot of people are picking that up. Uh, that's that's lovely and, and, and wonderful. I have to say people were asking about Hugh Newman and Michael Tellinger, and, you know, it was a joy to have both of them on the trip. <laughs> and uh, Michael was uh, was, you know, Michael is a joker, so he's always making jokes, but he also got sick towards the end uh and and so within his sickness he was still making jokes which was really um so typical of <laughs> michael and uh and Hugh he was also hit he got sick as well uh but they're both you know they're both a joy to have around and uh i i think that they would have their own stories to sh to share i i know one story about hugh newman that he was uh, feeling quite unwell. Uh, he did go down into the lower chamber. We actually had access to what's called the lower chamber in the Great Pyramid. When we had the entire Great Pyramid to ourselves, you must understand, uh, for two hours, we that was what we got. And uh, this was very, very early in the morning on the 20th. So technically in America, that would have been the night of the 19th. Uh, you know, even early evening of the 19th, because we were there like at 6 a.m. in the morning in Egypt. And um, so so we, Hugh Newman's, many of us did go to the very lower chamber. It's it's the underneath chamber. It's not usually accessible to the public. And Hugh said that when he, he finally stood up in there, that his entire sickness went away completely. He felt completely fine. And then when he went back up uh, into like the higher chambers and back outside, then his sickness returned. So he he's convinced that there was something within the the underneath chamber of the of the pyramid where probably you're out of the electromagnetic storm that was occurring around the pyramids because there was a, a tremendous yes. amount of current trailing, uh, a lot of ener you know energetics. In fact, my visions I had very clear visions. For example, on the twelfth when I was very very ill, I got a vision where actually I said to Rebecca who was sitting right next to me, um, I said to her at one point, you know, when I was in the Great Pyramid and then I sort of continued on and then I stopped myself and I said, well, wait a minute, I haven't been in the Great Pyramid yet. But apparently I had gone into the Great Pyramid that night. <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying the way it really was. And 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 I saw these, uh, these beings with um, sort of sabers. It was sort of a symbolic... But, oh shit! I remember that now. Oh, did I just say that on air? I did. Upcoming, yeah, you did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're bayonets or whatever these uh, sort of um, weapons of war drawn in four corners. So they were there were four of them, and they were coming at at each other from four different directions, and it was depicting a a war between good and evil going on in the Great Pyramid, and uh, I guess very symbolic of what's going on on Earth as well. But it was a terrific vision, and it was a terrific amount of energy that, that we were witnessing at that point. Um, that was just one of the, the times. The, well, was, and, and let, let, me, let me just reiterate here, too. I remember that now. I, I told you I couldn't remember the other two, but you just triggered that. And you were telling me about that, and then I, I remember uh, now – telling you about mine where two showed up two um like bayonets or uh, swords or something showed up in my vision on the same night yeah you had four and i had two and uh and there was something about the way that they were being held and i can't remember what i 
what that was about now, but I know that it was uh, inter- it, it had you know obviously it was tied in with the work that you were doing as well. So I think that was interesting. Whatever you and I had some kind of a shared experience uh, in that vision, uh, it was that was fascinating as well. I thought. Yes, absolutely, and uh, I want to say that uh, you also had a very interesting vision on the right before I guess I think it was the morning before we went into the Great Pyramid uh it was that night in you know before we got together you had mentioned seeing those very large beings uh circling do you remember oh my goodness yeah I do remember that now Can you oh yeah that was very that? bizarre yeah that was I may I may probably put that one on my brain because that one was bizarro yeah, and and they were they were there were there were all these beings larger than I mean super tall I mean just huge uh, floating around the pyramid just and that was that was the night before we went in. You're absolutely right. That was the night of the, before the morning we went in. Wow. Right. So so and and do you remember? I don't know if you're even remembering this, but I can remember what you described. One of the things you said that that. Although some of those beings were sort of negatively oriented, there were a few that actually looked at you and you could tell that they were positive beings and that they were um, sort of cloaked, cloaking themselves. You know, I do remember that now. I remember, I remember watch, I can see them now. Now I, I've got it back. Um, there were, you know, what we would call the white hats. I think that was the term I used. There were the white hats yes. among those that were uh, darkly aligned, and what they were doing was was trying to keep control of the pyramid and the energies and the information, and that that we were being assisted uh, because they were counteracting uh, the negative stuff that the dark entities was putting in there, and it was just like these brief imperceptible moments. Uh, because to do it any longer than that, they would have been, uh, they would have become exposed to the very group that they were involved in. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that goes <laughs> along with, that goes along with that guy talking about, uh, about his stuff on that other interview. Very fascinating. Wow, the correlations here are just tremendous, Carrie. Absolutely. And it, it was, uh, it, it sort of was a time in which we were outside of time in a certain, that, that was my sense of it. There was a sense that time was almost suspended while we were in Egypt. It was, I can't describe it or explain it. And I, I remember saying to you, I guess we're leaving tomorrow. Do you remember that thing where we're going? Yeah. I guess we're leaving, but do you think we're really leaving? <laughs> you know, it was kind of strange. It was, it, it was, you know, I, and just like I started out talking to you tonight is the whole thing was very surreal to me. And I think you actually said it very appropriately. Um, it was like it was suspended. We went from temple to temple to temple to temple. I mean, it was just one right after the other. Uh, we were on a mission. Yes. And, you know, I never once I never once thought about, well, God, what are we doing tomorrow? Uh, I never once thought about, uh, uh, you, you know, the normal traditional daily in and out day thoughts never yeah. entered my mind while I was there. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't look at a watch. I didn't look at a clock. I didn't, it was like, okay, um, I, well, it's time to go to sleep. We went to sleep. Uh, time to get up. Okay. We go, it's time to eat. Okay. I mean, it was like almost in a sense of being on this automated mode. But in a in a very different sense, not because it was robotic, but because it was like we were being well. It was being in the now. It was yeah. really being now. The you whole know. trip was like that. Yeah, it was like the now was just constant. Um, that's a little bit five D ish. I have to say. It is. Uh, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Uh, it, it's know, just I, didn't the I didn't come out of that for a couple of days after I got back. Me either. Absolutely. <laughs> You know, it's like, I mean, fact, when I come back, I was like, where am I and how am I supposed to act? Seriously. Yeah. I was, yeah, I no, was, really, it was really, I have to say the same thing. There Good. was a sense at which, oh, I'm back in this, in this place where now I have to act like a human. What does that entail exactly? Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, know, I, it's, it was so trippy. I have to say, because I'm even looking at some of the e- Egypt photographs as I talk to you here, uh, and really, you can totally get back in that, that mind space. It was such a trip. Um, someone was is asking questions here in the chat, and, and they're saying, uh, did we get info on how the pyramids were actually built? I mean... I have gotten a very clear yeah. download in the past about that. Uh, I, I can tell you that I have seen the stones. I've seen them moving. I, I, I can't describe it, but I have seen, uh, I've seen it. Um, and, and they levitate the stones. And Michael was very excited. It, this was a huge part of, of uh, sort of a, in a sense, I, I don't want to speak for him so much, but I, I can tell you the things he said to me. And one of the things was like, in a sense, this was like the capstone of his work coming all together where he got to see how really stones were moved by sound. And, and the sound and the onk, the use of the onk as, uh, as a device to move stones, uh, there's, it all kind of comes together when you're there. It's 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 so obvious. Uh, these stones are so gigantic, and um, I, I I have seen visions of of them being moved and so on. So um, I, I never had that much question about how they were built. But you know, Rebecca, if you want to address that question as well, you know, um, and I have to agree, and I I want to share with uh, the audience because again. Uh, I was working with Michael and here's, I've done, I was doing a couple of experiments, by the way, while I was there. Uh, and I, oh, we've got a break. Well, I'll, I'll talk about it when we come back after break because it was really fascinating. It ties in with Michael's work. Okay, we'll be right back with Rebecca Jernigan. Okay, this is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio, and we're talking to Rebecca Jernigan all about Egypt and our time there. Uh, Rebecca, right before the break, I think you were about to talk about something with Michael. Yeah, you know he he works. You know we uh, somebody was asking the question to kind of back up here about how the pyramids were built. Your vision showed, uh, you know the the blocks being put into place by levitation. Uh, could have been through sound or or, or other uh, type of a, a frequency. Some you know some kind of a frequency. Uh, but certainly something did move those. It wasn't done by, you know, uh, ropes and uh, pulleys and 20,000 men on each one. It was not done like that. Absolutely not. So I have to agree with you. So, you know, Michael's, uh, uh, from his uh, books and all of that, and, of course, you've, you know, interviewed him. You've been down to his place as well down there in Adam's calendar. Uh, a lot of harmonics go on there, uh, a lot of frequencies because of the sound, the sounds of the stones. So as we're uh, walking through the temples, you notice that there's all these columns. There's just these columns everywhere, with the exception of the middle of the temple. Through any of the temples, that seemed to be uh, the case of it. And if you kind of look at it, some of the uh, columns, uh, there just seemed to be way too many columns to hold up uh, the weight. Uh, That's what they said is that, you know, well, they had to have all these columns to hold up the weight of the ceiling. Um, and then you look at the hieroglyphs uh, on there, and they're very repetitive. I think you would agree with that. Uh, the hieroglyphs are very repetitive on all these columns. But if you go in there and you stand in those columns, and you're going, so what is this used for? Uh, because the space that the columns take up in between the columns, there really isn't any room uh, for anything else. It's not like you can have an audience in there. You could have anything else in there. It didn't appear to be uh, that, that they would use that for anything else. Uh, you, you know, there wasn't any space in there. So you go in there and you talk. If you're talking while you're within those columns, you realize that you're getting kind of a feedback uh, from your own voice or the voices uh, that mixed with the uh, hieroglyphics of the repetitiveness, right, of the, the pictures and, what are, you know, what they really mean. You step back out into the middle. You don't get that. And you keep going back and forth and back and forth. And you realize that perhaps... And this is just a theory now. I'm just theorizing here. Uh, based on uh, from the, the temples that we had went to, uh, because it seemed to be very apparent that a lot of these um, deities that were, you know, that are uh, gods and goddesses, pharaohs, whatever, uh, that were uh, portrayed in each of these temples, that they really wanted to make sure that you knew who these people were. 
I mean, it was very, very repetitive. I am raw, or I am this, or I am that, right? Everywhere, splashed all over. Uh, it's, it, to me, it felt like programming. You know, I got in there, and I was like, well, you know, what a way to program people, but through sound. So if they were using a sound frequency, now this, of course, would be on the negative aspect of it, right? But if they were using sound as a, as a form of mind control, uh, along with the visuals that you get from uh, these columns that perhaps that the hieroglyphics themselves kind of, as it were, would come to life based on different uh, frequencies of sound and it ends up becoming a program. Uh, like I am, you know, I am the Pharaoh bear, you know, bow down to me, kind of like you started out talking about, you know, I am your Lord and Master kind of a thing, right? And I'm, and, and, and I was talking to Michael about that. I was like, man, maybe this is some kind of a programming tool. So him and I were going back and forth through these columns and he's going, you know, there may be something to that. And so, you know, obviously there's no way of experimenting with it at this point any further, but, um, you know, that was one of my theories, Carrie, is when I got in there is, is that, that these columns didn't serve a huge amount of purpose except for maybe for the purpose of programming. Um, well, in some way. breaking up the space, uh, you know, is one of the, the things. And, of course, the symbolism, according to the guide, uh, Amro, was that uh, they are there because the entire the cosmos is seen as as an as an, a sea. And the, the, the columns are seen as uh, trees that break up the space. And so that's why they they do that. Um, they erect them in, in part. But yeah, there's there's no doubt that the columns must also, uh, on a sort of um, metaphysical level, serve other purposes. I wanted to say that one of the things we notice, because you go to uh, Abydos, which is Abydos is one of the famous, uh, one of the most authentic areas, and there's uh, behind Abydos is is the sunken, uh, I, I don't uh, temple. And I forget what it's called. And anyway, it is, uh, it is very, first of all, you don't get to go inside of it. And it's filled with water, which we have been told could have been drained a long time ago. They could be la- allowing people, uh, to go inside there. And it's fascinating. It's, it's made of, of, in a, it's, it's actually much older. In fact, it's even said to be at least as old as the pyramids and possibly older yeah. than the Sphinx or equal to the Sphinx, which is older than the pyramids. And um, one of the things about that is that was coming to me was that those stones, and if you look at the stones and it's very clear and graphic in photographs, you can see that the stones are not inscribed. This is where the so-called flower of life is, um, although I think that was added later. And, Everything else is completely blank. There are no inscriptions or anything. And the, the whole stonework is much more a bit like um, Stonehenge, in fact, and it also said to be something like uh, what you find in Peru and other, other places in South America. And these are massive, massive stones, even bigger than the stones uh, that built the pyramids. And what I noticed was that this was something where the beings that came down, at least that erected that particular t- temple, came first. And they did not inscribe. They did not put hieroglyphs. The hieroglyphs were put later by the humans or even the the, the half-human hybrids, the Nephilim, uh, that would be the Anunnaki human hybrids, who were doing the hieroglyphs as a form of worship of the so-called gods that built this original temple, and then building the other temples as uh, places to worship or honor these gods. And so, if you understand the hieroglyphs themselves were worship, were built, were, were their inscriptions sort of, yes, as a programming, as a sort of a, um, obedient worship of, of painting their gods and making them look beautiful and making them look um, very regal and so on. In other words, that was to keep the humans busy uh, with artwork and so on, and uh, worshiping in honoring their gods. But the original pyramids, uh, not pyramids, but, well, possibly even the original pyramids, but we don't see those, um, are, 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 are there all, without inscriptions because they were built by the original 
uh, beings. Any, anyway, it's it's just food for thought, uh, and this was stuff that was coming to me when I was there. Well, you know, I want to I want to add to the Abydos thing. That was, I, I meant to get back to that myself. Yeah, if you look at that, uh, if you look at that particular, you know, what you can see of it, you can tell that that is is not the same as anything else that was there. Yeah. I mean, it was it's just so different. It carries a very unique uh, energy, way different than uh, the ruins that are built on top of it, the temple that is built on top of it, uh, which was also fascinating. I think uh, we need to share with people, too, is that uh, that one particular place that we went to, was there three levels that we were able to see? And they said that there was a fourth one underneath where there's a mosque was built on top of it, and they started digging around, and then they got to uh, an, another um uh, another temple and then they dug again uh which is the temple that we were actually able to go to and they said that there was another one underneath it that they hadn't gotten to yet i mean it was just just fantastic uh how you you can literally see uh how the sand has covered up you know probably i would say there's still at least 70 to 80% that's not been shown yet that we haven't even been seen that, that that's not even been excavated yet but getting back to Abydos, um, I, I really got this feel. It was a very odd feeling. I, I got a very, very odd feeling while I was there um, because that energy that was originally there was more prevalent than anything else. And I thought, well, how strange that the oldest energy, uh, and it's been built on you know, several times here, is the stronger of all of these energies. And it's so very different. It feels... Um, it felt like to me, um, it, for the lack of a better way of saying it, it just felt more knowledgeable to me. It felt to me like it was of higher frequency or vibration than that which was built on top of it and that which was built on top of that. Um, and it also resembled some of the same energy that I had feeling of when looking at some of those plaques in that vision, by the way. It was similar. Uh-huh. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah, fascinating. The whole place is just uh, just unbelievable and indicates that 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 again our history is so hidden from us uh and and even where we are you know the countries we live in now uh obviously we we are living on top of 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 ruins uh and don't even know it and and i'm sure that the ones who build these underground bases in the earth they must come and cross uh even they may be building tunnels through in cities uh, in 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 the old cities where where there has been ruins and and possibly even uh, destroying a lot of the the true history of of humanity in the process. So um, you can just imagine the earth being kind of honeycombed throughout with uh, amazing uh, relics and 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 finds that were some are just not being shared with us. There there's no doubt there's a level at which. Uh, the Vatican and other places are are hiding the the truth about what really goes on. Uh, one of the museums we went to had photographs of old skeletons that they found that were skeletons of giants. Yes, exactly. Um, and uh, the one uh, oh, the one museum that we went to, uh, where were we at? Uh, not the one with just the mummies, but the one we went to before that can't remember what the place was uh but that one was my favorite museum of them all because what you got there was a huge variant of artifacts from that area uh the nubian museum nubian yep yep that's it that's and, in Luxor, i believe oh that one was the most fantastic museum because it showed uh it showed the relationship like uh, very huge, giant statues, um, and they showed relationships to, uh, the, you know, uh, other uh, beings that were smaller. Uh, there was uh, airships there. There was uh, jewelry there. There was that was an extraordinary, extraordinary museum. Extraordinary, loved it because it. I think it was more of a true representation of all of the variables that you'll find in Egypt. I really do. Yeah. Fascinating. 
fascinating and uh, much ignored museum, actually, the Nubian Museum. It's it's brand new. It's it's quite a, a stunning, stunning museum. We didn't get to spend as long as I would have liked. We were there in the in the dead of night. Uh, and the only one, again, the, practically the only ones in the museum <laughs> was very interesting. Uh, boy, some powerful, powerful uh, sort of sculptures and beings in that place, mm, sure. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it actually felt very comfortable for me in there. Um, mm. And then just to kind of share with people, Carrie, a little bit about what isn't being shown is uh, when we went to the museum with just the mummies, uh, where they had found, what, uh, 2,200 or something like that, and only 11 of them were in this museum, and they don't know what happened to the rest. That was when uh, we went out to the desert, uh, which was a very, very special time, uh, <laughs> really extraordinary time. But, yes, we were out in the o- oasis. Uh, it's called the Baharia Oasis, and it's, it's, it's a very fascinating area. Oh, it, it, that was that really was extraordinary. It was. But that little museum there had... Uh, very interesting mummies in it, um, th- and they they kept it locked, and um, you had to buy tickets, and then then the guy would go around and unlock it, um, and then it, it's very small one one just one really long room really is what it was, uh, filled with eleven mummies, uh, but they they did find twenty two hundred of them, uh, the the golden mummies I think is what they termed it, um, and. Nobody seems to know what happened to the other nineteen hundred and whatever, <laughs> or, or two twenty one hundred. They don't know what happened to them. They're just that they're just not there. And that was all that was left of the representation of the twenty two hundred gold mummies that they found. So I'd be I'd be really interested to know uh, what those other mummies look like because the ones that we've seen there, there was it seemed to be like maybe small children. Uh, they didn't all look to be of the same uh, ethnicity, if you want to call it that. Um, they certainly right. varied in age uh, and gender uh, and, and manner of dress. Uh, I thought just in those 11 mummies, that was, I thought that was extraordinary because they were, they were just so vastly variant. Right. Uh, someone was writing in here that the, the Nubian Museum was actually noted, uh, located in Aswan and absolutely right. That's correction. I said it was in Luxor and it was in Aswan. Uh, what we're talking about now is the museum that was located in the Baharia Oasis, where are the mummies. Those are actually Greek mummies, I think, from the time of Alexandria. And uh, that area is is very uh, just starting to be excavated. There is a ton of, of stuff there under the sands. And oh. they had discovered what are called the golden mummies. And I believe there's something like 200 and only 11 or something made it into this museum. And the museum itself is is a, a, a fair-sized building, but they blocked it off and they only use a tiny portion of it. Right. It's, kind of, it's almost laughable because they, they put a lot of money into the architecture and then they didn't use it. Um, I think that they have low tourism. Of course, they're having terrible tourism now. Uh, because there's such a, a, a an onslaught of propaganda to keep people away from Egypt, and it's working. And if we can do anything to uh, to reverse that, I, I'm happy to do so because it's me too it's ludicrous. Um, but uh, those those mummies are fascinating, and they are gold plated on the outside, real gold. And I'm you know during the t- the time of Zahi Awas, they disappeared where they were uh, somehow stealed away to somewhere. Uh, we don't know who who got hold of them or whatever, but they've been most of them are hidden away. Yeah, very sad uh, to see some of the things that's happened. One of the questions that came out of the chat box was, "What happened to Zawa Zahi Hawass? Was he a government operative?" Um, well, definitely, what? but uh, we we I believe he he's in hiding somewhere. Yeah, I know that. He, he was working for the United States and for the Illuminati, no doubt whatsoever about that. Um, he's considered, well, a wanted man in Egypt. So uh, I think he, I don't believe he's there in, in Egypt anymore. Well, and, and one of the things that our, our guide told us is that the e- Egyptians themselves uh, want to prosecute him. Absolutely. Yeah, they want to prosecute him for the crimes committed. Um, and of course, you know, like, like they said, nobody really knows where he's at. So, you know, obviously he's got friends in high places because there's not been any, 
any rumors of where he can be found. So I think that's also fascinating. Uh, it tells you uh, how very uh, how very much that he was a huge portion of the lockdown and what you know what he uh, allowed to get trickled out uh, to the public for public consumption. Uh, uh, someone is asking about a vortex of energy from the middle of the earth that's reached uh, through meditation in the pyramids. I mean, you can actually reach that through meditation anywhere. You don't have to be in the pyramids to reach it. Uh, but it, it goes beyond the earth. There's uh, there's actually a recent meditation that uh, Ashiana Dean has been leading people on, which takes uh, people to what they call Aurora Earth and to uh, to a, a, to the what. They call it Sun Eight, which is 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 way beyond, uh, I guess, the sun as we know it. So, um, you know, there are a lot of places you can go in meditation. Uh, and energy be t- going into the Middle Earth is is just part of it. Um, but but that's in rea- uh, a relation to the question that was asked. Um, one thing we could do here, I, I don't know, um, Ahmad, do we have callers? No, ma'am. Nobody's called. Uh, you didn't announce you were taking them, so. <laughs> okay. Well, we would uh, if we only have ten minutes left. But if if somebody wants to call in, we could certainly take take a call or two. Uh, Rebecca, you wouldn't mind, right? Oh no, absolutely not. I'm good with that. Okay. Um, but meanwhile, is there anything else you want to cover while we're we're still talking about all of this, Rebecca? Well, you know, I, I have to say, uh, Carrie, that the the entire trip itself, going through those ruins, um, you know, we we really were very well taken care of. We were able to see some things that were not uh, uh, yet available for the public. Um, I'm not going to mention those. Um, I feel very honored uh, to have witnessed some of those things myself. Uh, to have, you know, laid eyes upon some of these artifacts that, that has not yet been, uh, made available to public. Um, we were watched while we were there, uh, closely, especially in the Cairo Museum. Um, and I want to get back to Michael Tellinger and, and, uh, Hugh Newman for a minute. Uh, I think a funny story that I'd like to share is that we were in, um, uh, see, the, uh, the hotel where we're on the island, and I keep forgetting the name of it. Um, we were up there, yeah, we and we were having dinner. Do you remember that? We were all having dinner. Yeah, awesome. I mean, we were having a blast, <laughs> and I mean, seriously, was just fun. We were laughing and just really enjoying each other. Uh, they actually turned the lights out in the restaurant and made us leave <laughs> <laughs> because we were too loud. <laughs> well, we were about the only customers, though. That was yeah. Like- Funny. Yeah, it was it was I funny, know. and I I can't wait until the picture that I have of Michael I can get off my camera because it shows him with those we they had uh, linen napkins and he folded it up in a hat he folded it and placed it on his head as a hat and I have several pictures of him so I, I'm hoping that I'm able to um, get that put up on the site because that was when we got kicked out of the restaurant it was it was it was tremendously funny. Um, we we had a lot of funny moments in in all of the work that we did. We certainly had a lot of funny funny moments uh, because that's what uh, you know that's what it was about as well. It's not just about all seriousness. Uh, we laughed a lot. Um, we we got to see some authentic dancers on the ship. Uh, that was just fabulous. Uh, we got to dance with them as well as uh, watch them entertain us as well. It was really really fantastic to see some of the native authentic. Uh, dances and music and instruments that they played, especially out in the oasis with the uh, yeah, Bedouins. Uh, oh my God! Uh, if I could tell you to go anywhere in Egypt as well, uh, just to uh, find a whole different energetic is to go out to uh, the desert in Egypt. Certainly with a guide, obviously, uh, make them Bedouin guides, and and you will. I guarantee you, uh, it's an experience in and of itself, very separate from. Uh, the uh, temples and the pyramids, that energy there is, it, it's, it really is, it's, it's a very surreal world. Um, totally. It was such a trip and it was <sighs> very cleansing, you know, to be out there after, after all we'd been through. It was really the perfect thing to have done. It really was. I, I so enjoyed that portion of it. Uh, it really helped to, uh, to kind of reacclimate 
uh, after the intensity of that complete build up until we arrived in the pyramid and then, you know, all of us really did do the releasing. We let go and, and we, uh, got ourselves in there, uh, uh, for that, that moment in time that we were all there. Looks like yeah, you have a caller. Really, really wonderful. Uh, so at some point I'm going to be taking another trip, uh, to the Greek islands and, uh, hope to, to go where the, uh, where I, I forget what they're called. The, you know, the, the women that, uh, I, I don't know what they're called. They go into um, meditations. It's on a certain Greek island, and I forget which one it is. But anyway, uh, I'm being being uh, sort of sent there, and so I'm going to put a group together and, and do that. And it, maybe we can try to get you along, Rebecca. Uh, it, it, it just was so much fun to have you there, and it was just great to have the other speakers as well. It's fun when you can get a bunch of speakers on one trip. Like, usually they only have one speaker on a trip. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's just fun to have more than one speaker because uh, it's just a blast. To- well, I would enjoy that. That would be uh, fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, well, okay. Is there anyone on the on the phone before we we depart? Because we think we're about to close down the show altogether. Yes, ma'am. Six one four. Y'all got about two minutes. Okay, caller. Do you want to ask a question? Uh, Mary, what I would like to know is if uh, you were discussing photographs that you received in Egypt. Is yes. Is there any way those could be posted on your site, particularly um, the ones that had imagery with spirit? Okay, yes, um, we're hoping to do that. I, I, you know, I have to, uh, first of all, find out wh- whether I, I'm, like I said, I'm in the transition with the mm-hmm. webmaster, but once we get that set up, uh, I'm hoping we can do that. So that, that would be a lot of fun. I could try to put some of them on my Facebook. Uh, I, I kind of wanted to do it with everyone because everyone took, had different pictures and, you know, mm-hmm. I think it would be fun if we got to get all of them out there. But I don't know if everyone wants them to be public or not. Yes. That's also something of an issue. So I, I do receive spirit images in my photography quite often. So I would be really, really excited to see what you got in Egypt. Yeah, it's it's fun and it's fascinating. Uh, so that that would be very cool. So we're, we're going to work on that. So don't okay. worry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, it's been lovely, as always, to have you on the show. Is there any one last-minute things you want to say? Uh, only that I just really had a tremendous time. It was uh, truly a life-altering experience, uh, one that I'm still uh, uh, digesting and still uh, growing into. Tons and massive quantities of information is still coming in, even as we speak. Uh, it's been It's been more than fascinating. Uh, and there's still many, many pieces, and obviously we could sit and talk about this for weeks and still not cover everything uh, that we experienced there. So I thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be a part of it, and I certainly enjoyed each and every person in our group. We just had a really fantastic group. Uh, the people worked very well together. It was, it was just really thrilling um, to see the camaraderie and the uh, closeness that we all had for people that didn't even know each other. It was fan- it was fantastic. It was beautiful. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, very good energy uh throughout most of the trip. So thank you for everything uh as well. And it was a joy to, to be among everyone and and to be out there in these most amazing places in a very special time. So Yes, I would say the energies are still coming in. Uh, you, you, you can feel them even mm. here, wherever you are on the planet. I think people are feeling that uh, the energy is continuing. Uh, and I'm sure everyone had their own special stories for 2012, uh, December of 2012. But January of 2013 is 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 rocking and rolling. And um, I was just saying that I think 2013 is like 2012 on steroids. <laughs> Uh, I have to agree. <laughs> so, uh, so, so it was fasten your seatbelt because it's just starting. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to take a while for all these energetics to sink in, man. And when I mean sink in, I mean sink up. You know, uh, absolutely. So yeah, yeah. What a ride. No doubt about <laughs> it. Uh, okay, do you want to plug maybe your radio show while you know while we got a few minutes here? What when are you on and all that? Sure. Um, people can find me at journeyswithrebecca.com. I'm on Tuesdays, uh, 8 to 10 p.m. on Wolf Spirit Radio. And then, of course, Thursdays and Fridays, 
uh, 7 to 9 p.m., and this is all central time. So I'm on on Friday nights uh, just before your show, and I'm also on again Thursday nights, 7 to 9 p.m., same time slot, uh, central time. Uh, also have my timeline integration workshop coming up on December 20th. You can find all that information on my website. Uh, I'm adding new content. My new website just went up January 1st. Uh, so what a way to, to rock out the new year uh, with my new website getting up. Um, and so, you know, obviously when you get a new website up, it's it's a work in progress. Um, and so I'm adding content literally daily now. Uh, so I appreciate it, and I hope everyone comes and, and listens to uh, my guests as well. And Carrie, as always, it's just been fun, fun, fun. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And everyone, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a lot of fun. And, well, we've got, uh, I guess, Michael Hemmingson on American Freedom Radio on Wednesday night. And uh, no bad-mouthing, but we will be having some fun investigating uh, whether he is indeed the former White Hat or not. Take care. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.